Okay. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming today. My name is Jennifer Behrens, and I'm the Associate Director for Administration and Scholarship here at the Duke Law School. And on behalf of the Goodson Law Library, I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to the eighth annual alumni author event. This series began in 2012 as a celebration of both National Library Week and the Law School's Reunion Weekend. We're a little late on both of those things this year, but that's okay. Our speaker this year is Anders Walker, who received his JD as well as an MA in History in the class of 1998, and is now the Lily Myers Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research and Engagement at St. Louis University School of Law. Today, Anders will be presenting his recent book, The Burning House, Jim Crow and the Making of Modern America. You can find it, as well as his 2009 book, The Ghost of Jim Crow, How Southern Moderates Use Brown v. Board of Education to Stall Civil Rights, in the library's alumni authors collection, which is now shelved by call number all throughout the library. The Ghost of Jim Crow is also available as an ebook to the Duke community. Before we get started, I need to take a moment to thank a few people who helped make today's event possible. First and foremost, the Law Library's business manager, Sue Hicks, for her assistance with this event planning and logistics, our events office and media services staff, and of course, all of you for being here today. Here with us to introduce Anders Walker and to provide a few introductory remarks about his work is our own Jim Coleman, Duke's John S. Bradway Professor of the Practice of Law, Director of the Center for Criminal Justice and Professional Responsibility, and Co-Director of the Wrongful Convictions Clinic. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you. Um, this is uh, really special for me. Uh, to uh, introduce uh, Anders. Um, I knew him uh, back when he was a student here at Duke, um, uh, working on his uh, master's degree uh, in history. I have no idea how I got involved in that, but uh, I, 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 I did. I, I enjoyed reading uh, what he was writing at that time. Uh, and I think that, uh, that his writing uh, has evolved uh, to where it is today uh, in a, a very interesting way. Uh, I think uh, the, the book that he's going to talk about today offers uh, some uh, really important insights uh, into uh, you know, Southern history, the Jim Crow period, uh, segregation uh, in the United States, um, and uh, you know, uh, rather than looking just at uh, all of the reasons that uh, those things have been legitimately uh, denounced, uh, also looking at some of the positive things that came out of it by necessity. Um, and uh, th this book uh, talks about uh, that, about the diversity that was born of segregation, uh, the cultural uh, uh, advancements, uh, uh, accomplishments of African Americans uh, during that period, uh, which were important and which contributed to the diversity of America uh, that often are uh, ignored, and particularly ignored in our discussion uh, about uh, integration, uh, about you know uh, Brown, which I. I said that uh, segregated education was inherently bad for uh, black children. Uh, at the time uh, of that decision, there were uh, people who pushed back against that notion, uh, primarily uh, because it seemed to negate uh, the, uh, the, the cultural advancements uh, that uh, had been achieved and were being achieved. Uh, and that were being ignored, but that contributed to American culture. Uh, what Andrews uh, has done in this book is to talk about uh, uh, that period, talk about the, uh, some of the reactions uh, of a whole range of writers, Southern writers, uh, black and white, uh, pushing back against the uh, Brown uh, decision uh, and uh, uh, and, and basically uh, suggesting that uh, integration wasn't all that great uh, and, and might, in fact, uh, uh, there might be a high price to pay for the attempt uh, at uh, integration. 
I, so I'm going to I'm going to leave my remarks there. I, I you know I really um, Anders sent me a uh, an article that he wrote that uh, sort of pulls from his book, um, and I read it and uh, it, it was as excited as I've ever been reading a law review article. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to go out uh, and, uh, and get this book and read it. Uh, one of the things that it does is uh, it, it sort of recasts Justice Thomas in a different light uh, in some of his uh, opinions in uh, education uh, cases, and I'm sure uh, Anders will talk about that. Uh, let me just say uh, he is uh, the uh, Lily uh, Myers Professor of Law uh, at St. Louis University School of Law. Uh, he's been there since uh, 2006. Uh, he got his JD uh, here at Duke, uh, and uh, as well as his Master's of Art in History, uh, and he got a PhD from uh, Yale University. Uh, he's also uh, been um, voted Teacher of the Year uh, so many times uh, at uh, St. Louis University that I'm sure if he ever retires, they will rename the award after him. So welcome back to Duke. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be back. I uh, learned criminal law in this room. Professor Beal was my professor. <clears throat> Let me begin in 1978. Supreme Court Justice Lewis F. Powell, Jr. declared diversity to be a compelling interest, the first time the court had ever recognized the concept. In the same opinion, Powell also closed the door on affirmative action. It is far too late, wrote Powell in Regents versus Bakke, to argue that the guarantee of equal protection to all persons permits the recognition of special wards entitled to a degree of protection greater than that accorded others. This comment was a bit of a puzzle. The term special wards came from Reconstruction when President Andrew Johnson called an end to the Union Army's effort to reform the South after the Civil War. Powell seemed to be calling a similar end to civil rights rejecting the idea that the University of California could take affirmative measures to address past or present discrimination. And yet, even as he closed the door on affirmative action, he endorsed diversity. Why? Quote, a farm boy from Idaho can bring something to Harvard that a Bostonian cannot, argued Powell. Similarly, a black student can usually bring something that a white person cannot. This was not a uniquely Southern view, to be sure, nor was it Powell's alone. The plaintiffs had argued as much in their brief in the case. However, Powell's endorsement of diversity at the same time as he invoked the South's struggle to end Reconstruction raised the intriguing possibility that he was elevating a particular form of diversity, a version hostile to government efforts aimed at achieving equality, like affirmative action, but appreciative of racial difference nevertheless. A version that, it occurred to me, might come from the South. Powell, native of Richmond, Virginia. But there are many Southerners of his class, and this is really an intellectual history of educated Southerners who grew up in Jim Crow, who were not uh, George Wallace types. Robert Penn Warren, was such a person. He argued for a similar concept uh, as early as 1929. He's probably the most articulate, eloquent expositor of Southern pluralism. Uh, Warren chose not to describe racial segregation as a repressive legal regime, so much as a place where African Americans could thrive, free from the influence of whites. To make his point, Warren borrowed an image from an African American folktale about a rabbit who outsmarts a fox. In the story, Brother or Br'er Rabbit is captured by the fox and begs not to be cast into a tangle of prickly, scrambling shrubs, a briar patch. Of course, Br'er Rabbit refuses to confess that he, like other rabbits, grew up in precisely such an environment and could easily negotiate the thorns and escape. For Warren, the motif described Jim Crow. Just as Br'er Rabbit considered the briar patch a place of safety, 
so too did Warren liken racial segregation to a haven, a legal refuge that allowed African Americans to develop their own traditions, their own institutions, their own culture, their own creative self-expression apart from whites. This on its face sounds odd, particularly today we review or we remember Jim Crow as a system of repression, full stop. Uh, many have written off the briar patch as a ruse, a type of charade to simply defend Jim Crow. A case for segregation veiled in a celebration of culture that was duplicitous. Mm. However, evidence exists to suggest that whites in the South, like Warren, took a genuine interest in diversity and in African American artistic expression. It's important here to go to artists, to writers, people who are generally interested in cultural production, not necessarily people who are working for votes. In the winter of 1926, for example, <clears throat> African American intellectual and civil rights leader James Weldon Johnson wrote a white professor at UNC named Guy Johnson on the topic of African American vernacular music. Weldon Johnson was born in Florida and had already enjoyed national acclaim for composing a popular tune entitled Lift Every Voice and Sing, later celebrated as Black America's national anthem. Executive Secretary of the NAACP in New York, James Weldon Johnson merged art and politics by dedicating himself to the political and cultural dismantling of negative racial stereotypes, including negative cultural portrayals of African Americans in literature and film. He did this by recovering authentic African-American folklore and music. Of course, gathering black Southern folklore in New York was a challenge. To aid him in this project, James Weldon Johnson enlisted UNC professor Guy Johnson. <clears throat> On January, 19, uh, January 29, 1926, James Weldon Johnson wrote Guy Johnson a letter noting that he was working on a book recovering black secular music and that the white North Carolinians' firsthand knowledge and nearness to the source material would not only be of great assistance to him, but might in fact prove invaluable to the project. Guy Johnson had been studying African American folklore in the South. He studied it seriously. It wasn't a ruse for segregation. This was his topic of academic inquiry. Guy Johnson traveled to New York. Imagine this, he left Chapel Hill on a train, went to New York City to meet with James Weldon Johnson, one of the key figures in the Harlem Renaissance. <clears throat> he brought with him a collection of melodies that he had transcribed in African American churches in North Carolina. James Weldon Johnson took down copies of the melodies and then sent Guy Johnson back to procure more. So Guy Johnson is working for James Weldon Johnson. It's a type of folklorist. <clears throat> If you can give me an idea of what kind of songs we should look for, wrote Johnson from Chapel Hill to New York, it'll expedite my work considerably. At the top of Weldon Johnson's list was music that qualified as authentic African-American folk songs. And this was a time in American history where it had become very popular for people in the North to write about the South in Southern vernacular without any real connection to the South. So songs like Sewanee, for example. Uh, were popularized, but not authentic, and often portrayed African Americans in a stereotypical light. Al Jolson uh, is an example of this. 1927, he came out with a talking movie uh, about plantation life where he is dressed in blackface. James Weldon Johnson was uh, outraged that people like Al Jolson, even though Jolson was, uh, many claim, pro-civil uh, rights, that Al Jolson was the representative of African American art. James Weldon Johnson wanted a true African-American art. That Guy Johnson uh, aided James Weldon Johnson is a story that has not been recovered uh, before, but uh, I think it underscores the idea that Southerners took culture seriously, at least educated uh, elites. Though Guy Johnson possessed little interest in civil rights, he did not uh, endorse civil rights or desegregation. He did believe in promoting culture including African-American culture, something that both James Weldon Johnson and Elaine Locke thanked him for. Elaine Locke wrote to Guy Johnson, thanking him for his contributions. Uh, Elaine Locke also was a pivotal figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Both Locke and 
Weldon, James Weldon Johnson spent the 1920s engaged heavily in promoting black writers and artists, a campaign that would contribute to what the New York Herald Tribune declared in 1925 to be a renaissance of black art, music, and letters in Harlem. Now, the Harlem Renaissance is often associated geographically with New York. I argue it's really a renaissance of the South. It's Southern African American culture. That African American culture was valuable and worth documenting was a point lost on the Supreme Court of the United States. In 1954, the court cited a study by a Swedish sociologist named Gunnar Myrdal who declared that the solution to the American dilemma of race was full assimilation of African Americans into mainstream white society. Black institutions, black traditions, and black culture, argued Myrdal, should be done away with, for they were at best inferior, at worst pathological. Myrdal was brought to the United States by the Carnegie Corporation because he was from Sweden, a non-imperial nation, and Myrdal was charged with providing a frank, objective study of racism in the South. Myrdal does that. He documents lynching. He documents disfranchisement. He document, documents the humiliation that went with Jim Crow. But then he misses the idea that there may be something valuable in African-American traditions, institutions, and cultural practices. He's Swedish. He doesn't understand diversity. He believes in assimilation. Everyone should wear clogs. Everyone should shop at Ikea. <laughs> Everyone should drink buttermilk. And even today, Sweden is struggling with diversity. And Swedish socialism, which Myrdal was really central to, was very much based on a homogeneity in Swedish culture. And so Myrdal looks at the South and says, I know what the answer is. It's IKEA. Everyone should just be the same. <laughs> African-American intellectual and writer Ralph Ellison disagreed. Ellison made this clear in a scathing review of Gunner's study, American Dilemma, in 1944, which, as he saw, it, portrayed African American life as simply a reaction to the dominant white majority. How, asked Ellison, can a people live and develop for over 300 years simply by reacting? Ellison was reluctant to view African American culture as pathological and challenged Myrdal's claim that white culture was somehow better. Noting, for example, that radio advertising, Hollywood, and lynching were all products of white culture, and that African Americans stood little to gain from embracing these things. Quote, why if my culture is pathological, asked Ellison, must I exchange it for these? Such thinking reemerged in his novel, Invisible Man. As Ellison's unnamed protagonist declared that his lowly position in a basement in New York boasted more positive energy than Times Square. Quote, my whole is form warm and full of light, began Ellison's hero. I doubt if there is a brighter spot in all New York than this whole of mine. And I do not exclude Broadway or the Empire State Building. New York's most iconic locations, argued Ellison's narrator, are, quote, among the darkest of our whole civilization. Pardon me, our whole culture. Ellison, too, looked to African American culture as a source of inspiration and authenticity. Precisely because African Americans were shut out of white culture due to segregation, condemned to its basement, as Ellison put it, Ellison felt they had gained a critical perspective on America's shortcomings, developing instead their own counterculture that boasted much of great value and richness. Now, in my next project, uh, I'm going to argue that it's not just counterculture, it actually is American culture. It's just American culture ahead of its time. <clears throat> Ellison argued there's much of great value and richness um, in the Black South. Such richness needed to be recorded and broadcast, argued Ellison, not erased. Rather than assimilate, Ellison recommended a change in the basis of American society that would not only incorporate African American culture into American identity, but highlight it. It would rewrite the narrative of the United States along African American lines. Other black intellectuals agreed. None more vocally than Zora Neale Hurston. He wrote a famous letter to the Orlando Sentinel in 1955. In that letter, she said, I regard the US Supreme Court as insulting rather than honoring my race. Balking at the presumption that African Americans wanted to rub shoulders with Caucasians, Af <clears throat> African Americans wanted opportunity and resources, she argued, not intimacy. Quote, since the days of the never to be sufficiently deplored reconstruction, lamented Hurston, there has been current the belief that there's no greater delight to African Americans than physical association with whites. 
Not true, she maintained. The very idea was an insult to blacks. Quote, no one seems to touch on what is most important, she argued, namely that the whole matter revolves around the self-respect of my people. Black self-respect, she argued, precluded the notion that African Americans wanted anything to do with whites. Those who supported integration, she argued, should look to Native Americans who had fought valiantly for their own traditions, their own lands. As much as the Supreme Court tried to argue that African Americans were damaged by Jim Crow, in other words, Hurston argued that African Americans were fine on their own. It was whites who suffered from shortcomings, not least a perverse penchant for repression. Now, Hurston and Ellison are both very clear. Uh, resources uh, are important, access to opportunity, and the end of humiliation, which was central to Jim Crow, the end of terrorism, violence. These were all things that needed to happen, but not necessarily the elimination of African American cultural traditions. <clears throat> Quote, the idea of human slavery is so deeply grounded in European history, wrote Hurston, that the pink toes, which was her term for white people, can't get it out of their system. To illustrate, she cited the British colonization of India. If the English people were to quarter troops in France, argued Hurston, they would be accidentally execrated. However, the British government does just that in India to the glory of the democratic way and are hailed not as not only great empire builders, but leaders of civilization. Such pretensions bothered Hurston, who felt that Southern whites addressed their cruelty and violence in the garb of cultural superiority. Hurston was joined, surprisingly, by the South's most preeminent man of letters, William Faulkner, who penned a novel in 1936 that cast the white South and white America in negative terms. Styled Absalom, Absalom, the book told the story of a white planter, Thomas Sutton, who flouts civility and manners to selfishly construct a huge plantation in Mississippi, only to then marry an evangelical preacher's daughter named Ellen Coldfield and produce two, two children, Henry and Judah. The marriage, in Faulkner's telling, symbolized the marriage of rapacious capitalism, Thomas Sutpin, who builds this plantation in Yaknapa, Tafla County, and evangelical prohibitionism. There was neither wine nor whiskey at their betrothal dinner, wrote Faulkner. The couple are ultimately undone by interracial progeny. One day, a stranger appears in Yagnabatafa County who befriends Henry and courts Judith, the Sutman's children. Just as they prepare to welcome the stranger named Charles Bond into their household, Bond reveals two secrets. One, he reveals that he's the long lost son of Thomas Sutman, and therefore he is Henry and Judith's brother. Two, he reveals that he's black. Henry, citing not the incest, but the miscegenation, promptly shoots him. Not visibly black, Thomas Sutton had an interracial relationship in Haiti with a woman who was light-skinned. Charles Bond reflected the paranoia in the South over racial purity, a paranoia that Faulkner likened, along with rapacious capitalism and evangelical Protestantism, to a burning house. <clears throat> Faulkner calls Sutton's plantation, Sutton's hundred, a burning house. Faulkner wanted, more than anything, a drink. He couldn't get one in Oxford, Mississippi. I was there this summer. Allegedly, he had connections with bootleggers. He would purchase bootleg whiskey and bury it in his garden. He viewed the direction the United States was going in the 1920s as extremely repressive, uh, extremely focused and paranoid on a vision of race, of Anglo-Saxon Protestant supremacy that was actually limiting his own liberty. And so Faulkner makes a turn away from white civilization and society, not completely dissimilar from Hurston and Ellison. He too says, what exactly are we doing here? Remember the 20s endorsed prohibition, the 20s endorsed eugenics, the 20s endorsed sterilization, the Supreme Court sanctioned sterilization of Buck versus Bell, and we were marching down a road that James Whitman in his new book, Hitler's American Model, and Tim Snyder in Black Earth argue actually inspired Germany. Uh, Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf wrote about the United States and how it was a model for what Germany could be, a Teutonic nation that used strict immigration restrictions and bans on interracial marriage to maintain racial purity, meanwhile commanding a continent. And this becomes Germany's dream in World War II. Faulkner recoils at 
And he sees, like Warren, the United States going down this totalitarian path. They see diversity, racial pluralism, as a possible way out of this. No one sensationalized the idea of white America as a burning house more famously than James Baldwin, a prominent novelist and essay writer. Quote, there's certainly little enough in the white man's public or private life that one should desire to imitate, observed Baldwin, in an essay to his nephew. For, as he said, white people cannot in the generality be taken as models of how to live. Rather, the white man is himself in sore need of standards, which will release him from his confusion and place him once again in fruitful communion with the depths of his own being. Baldwin expressed doubts about Myrdal's view of assimilation into the white mainstream, suggesting instead that whites were flawed, their civilization compromised, and that only African Americans had achieved unconditional, only when African Americans had achieved unconditional freedom would the country endure. Further, it would be African Americans, not whites, to lead the country's salvation, to be bearers of its aspirational ideals in part because only they could lead their white peers to discover their buried moral conscience. This proved controversial. Flannery O'Connor was outraged. Quote, the kind I don't like, she wrote, is the philosophizing, prophesying, pontificating kind of African American, the James Baldwin kind, who were humiliating Southern whites like herself in prominent literary mag magazines like The New Yorker. The journal had published Baldwin's essay to rave reviews, prompting Baldwin to reissue it along with the, the letter to his nephew in a small book entitled The Fire Next Time in 1963. The title hailed from an African-American spiritual and alluded to the second coming of Christ, something that O'Connor, a devout Catholic, did not take lightly. Yet, behind O'Connor's anger at Baldwin nestled a variety of ideas about race that resonated oddly with Baldwin's own claims. For example, O'Connor published a story in the Suwannee Review just before she excoriated James Baldwin that portrayed African Americans as inhabiting a higher moral plane than whites, a notion that Baldwin himself had advanced. In her story, O'Connor described a vision of a vast swinging bridge extending upward from earth to heaven, upon which treads a procession of souls reminiscent of Matthew 20, 16, where Jesus of Nazareth had declared that the last on earth would be the first to enter paradise. Whites were not first in the line. They were in the back, behind, quote, bands of blacks, who magically outranked whites, despite or perhaps because of their social prestige. The scene provided a startling glimpse of Jim Crow through a biblical lens, essentially inverting the theory of white supremacy by suggesting that those who enjoyed white privilege were morally compromised, while those who occupied the lowest social positions in the South were closest to God. O'Connor's vision paralleled Robert Penn Warren's notion of the briar patch and Ralph Ellison's metaphor of the invisible man's basement full of light. So the book is largely a literary study trying to get at the intellectual history of Southern elites. The story of the South has been heavily uh, focused on politics, and that has usually meant a focus on uh, populists. Now, my first book on Southern moderates got into some of these themes, but politicians are often not the most eloquent expositors of a society's values. Writers are. So writers, especially uh, in the South, are trying to explain what their world is like and how they live with themselves. Now, Robert Penn Warren gets very interested in this. And in 1964, he starts to interview civil rights leaders. Uh, he interviews Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the most renowned proponents of integration. Warren interviewed King on March 18, 1964, in Atlanta. He asked the minister about, quote, the pull on the one hand toward black traditions or black culture, and the pull on the other hand toward white culture, as Myrdal had endorsed. Now, this was not one of the, the themes, or not one of King's regular themes, uh, to be sure, he had endorsed Myrdal positively, but King conceded Warren's point about African-American traditions. Remember, King came from the black church. <clears throat> he acknowledged it actually was an issue, the question of culture in the South. 
But he believed that civil rights and pluralism could coincide. One can live in American society with a certain cultural heritage, explained King, African or what have you, and still absorb a great deal of mainstream society. African Americans who rejected their culture, however, suffered for it. Often, King said, black individuals who reject psychologically anything that reminds them of their heritage find themselves with no cultural roots. So King, in many ways, has a more modern idea of equality and diversity coinciding, something that I think most Americans today would agree with. Southerners, especially white Southerners, <coughs> including Lewis F. Powell Jr., weren't convinced that equality and diversity could coincide. Powell seemed to think that equality and diversity might be diametrically opposed. Warren, however, was happy to hear from <coughs> King that he understood and appreciated the rich history of African American traditions in the South, which of course King appreciates because he's a minister. This was a point that Warren had been trying to make since 1929. There's this uh, history of Warren that he abandons the Briar Patch and he becomes a civil rights activist. I argue that's not necessarily the case. Warren does come to understand that there's a justice in the South, but he never abandons his position on a pluralist culture in the South. He never gives up on diversity. Now he appeared to have an ally in King, of all people, whose public writings and speeches seem to stress assimilation. A dreamscape where the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would attend the same schools, play at the same parks, sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Warren's questions teased out a different dream, a society in which Black and white might sit down together, perhaps at school or work, but might go their separate ways. Of course, this was not what Gunnar Myrdal had imagined, since he found African American culture to be pathological. But Warren sensed correctly that this aspect of Myrdal's thought was not something even Dr. King ascribed to. After reading Warren's interview with King, Eudora Welty wrote to Warren praising him. My thanks are late in coming, but they're warm as can be for your book. So one of the things the book does is it actually it recovers conversations between people. Warren and Ellison sit down together at the American Academy in Rome in 1956, and they have this huge conversation about pluralism. And Ellison says, look, Warren, I don't really like you or your people, but I do respect the fact that you understand I have some important cultural contributions here, and I, too, am a pluralist. So there's debates. They're not all of the same mind. But there are uh, a lot of interconnections and interactions between these intellectuals who are trying to think about diversity before it's really uh, a thing. It's Louis F. Powell Jr. who makes diversity a thing. Uh, they're more uh, likely to refer to these things in terms of pluralism. My thanks are late coming, but they're warm as can be for your book, Gus Welty, to Warren on August 22, 1965. It's so good. And I've read it with such care, deep interest, profound admiration, and I may say some anguish for you as the subject. Welty then proceeded to write a short story about life in the South, a tale of a white doctor who treats African-American patients. The story talks about how the white doctor entered African-American communities and felt a sense of spiritual renewal. He talks about the African-American church. He talks about the close-knit relationships that African-Americans had with each other and with whites in the South. And Welty, in many ways, is trying to tell a story to adults that another writer, Harper Lee, told much more successfully to children. Southern writers like O'Connor, Welty, and Warren all viewed, that, all viewed Harper Lee as a children's author, kind of a YA novelist. Lee, however, is probably the best, most renowned proponent of cultural pluralism uh, that we have with us today. Uh, she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird in 1960 about a white lawyer who defends an African-American client. The lawyer, Atticus Finch, uh, in his closing arguments, made a case for pluralism. He claimed that Tom Robinson would never have been put on trial if Mayella Ewell had not lured him into her shack to try to seduce him, thereby crossing the line and violating the sacred code of the South. Lee set Ewell and Robinson up as a counterpoint to Atticus and Calpurnia. Calpurnia is Atticus's servant who raises two children with him, Scout and Jeff. Calpurnia's name is the name of Julius Caesar's third wife. She is the proxy wife to Atticus. 
Atticus' name is an allusion to ancient Greece and to platonic love, to the idea that the races can work in close harmony together so long as they adhere to the code of the South, which is segregation. And in one scene, which is a recurring trope in Southern lit, Calpurnia takes Scout and Jem to her church. And at her church, Scout and Jem are surprised that Calpurnia speaks a different vernacular. There's a different liturgy, there are different hymns, and Scout says, this is something amazing. I've never seen it before. I didn't realize it existed in Macomb. It's Lee's way of saying, this is the South. It's pluralist, it's diverse. And my story is about how the races get along. Sadly for her, the book was quickly picked up as a civil rights manifesto. She then fell silent for decades until her book, Ghost at a Watchman, was released, where we all learned that Atticus Finch actually was a segregationist. But I argued that's there in Mockingbird if you read closely uh, the narrative about this crossing the line, why Tom Robinson is put on trial, and why Atticus and Galpernia sail off into the sunset together. Now, let me bring all this back to a lawyer who in many ways modeled himself after Atticus Finch. Lewis F. Powell, Jr. believed in diversity within institutions, but also across institutions. So in some key opinions, including an opinion about the University of Mississippi uh, for women, Powell argued that there could be diversity across institutions. This could mean that uh, even institutions that might want to remain homogenous, like all women's colleges, could provide diversity of options for people who wanted to uh, experience a different form of pedagogy. When he writes Regents versus Rocky, I argue that he has this notion of diversity as a core American value. It has nothing to do with equality or affirmative action. It really does have something to do with liberty. Powell sees diversity and liberty as linked. He is a very afraid of the centralization of state power. He fought in World War II. In 1958, he goes to the Soviet Union with the ABA. He's shocked at what the Soviets were able to do in a very short amount of time, industrialize. And he's also alarmed at the way in which they controlled culture. He saw the Soviet Union as totalitarian. He saw Nazi Germany as totalitarian. He saw Richmond as land of liberty, ironically. And part of that liberty was its diversity, its uh, disaggregated landscape, something that Heather Gerken calls second order diversity. So the takeaway from this book, I think, uh, for con law, is we tend to think of diversity as first order diversity. We have diversity or we accept race and admissions in uh, higher education in order to facilitate cross-racial understanding, in order to bring students together in the same classrooms. Well, that's certainly possible, but there's also another form of diversity that Gherkin calls second order diversity, and that is majority minority spaces, black spaces. Uh, there's recent sociological uh, data to suggest that even at majority white schools, African Americans benefit from both forms of diversity, i.e. integration in classrooms, but also their own spaces where they're, where they're not subjected to microaggressions, implicit bias, and often or sometimes outright hostility. This type of diversity has been operationalized or departmentalized in uh, things like black studies. Black studies is not something that has been talked about in any of the litigation on diversity, including the current case by the Students for Fair Admissions uh, against Harvard. But I argue we should recover this vision of diversity, separate institutions, separate spaces. This is what Powell was also talking about. It wasn't just integration. He actually didn't really believe in integration. And if we add this to first order diversity, we have another argument for why race should be considered in admissions. Uh, I think this could be relevant to the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard case, and I think it actually describes the way that diversity works. Uh, yes, we can benefit from interracial interaction, but we can also benefit from things like African American studies, and here in the interest of full disclosure, I'll conclude, I have a PhD in African American studies. And as a white student, the only white student, in a set of classes, my pedagogical experience was actually quite profound. Uh, I learned things about the United States that I never heard of as a minority who sat silently in class while the majority uh, decided, or dissented by decided, as Gherkin puts it, turned the tables on the majority, told a very different story about the United States. And so I personally benefited from the fact that there was black space at Yale at the departmental level. That's not mentioned at all in any of the litigation on diversity. But I think it's important 
One, for majority students like myself. Two, it's important for minority students who have a place where they can uh, seek support uh, from having to constantly be subjected to the majority and all of the things that second order diversity uh, rather than first order diversity accomplishes. Let me uh, end there and um, I look forward to your responses. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so we now have time for questions. Yes. Um, thanks so much for your talk, Anders. Um, I'm interested in the latter point um, that you were making about Justice Powell and his understandings of liberty, right? So Powell goes to the Soviet Union. He sees Soviet censorship, right? He abhors Soviet censorship. But in the 1960s, he's on college campuses, right? And he sees the radical 1960s. And he sees a way in which, for at least Powell, um, liberals sort of created a, a small ideological spectrum that liberals silenced the voices of conservatives and moderates. I'm interested in sort of thinking about Powell and how did his conceptions of liberty de-radicalize college campuses, right? By putting the ideas to put more voices <laughs> in a particular space, so more conservative and more moderate voices. Did his conception of diversity seek to sort of de-radicalize mm -hmm. the radical college campuses of, ninth, of the 1960s and 1970s as a racial moderate? Uh, that's a great question. That brings Federalist 10 to mind, which is faction. And so maybe Powell thought, we just bring everybody together, and it'll <coughs> kind of moderate the voices. Powell was very concerned about the, the radical left. And he became a little histrionic. So he's often quoted for this memo he wrote, this kind of a secret memo to, in the defense of business in the United States and the private sector. And so I haven't thought about that, but it's possible. Maybe he thought this would be a moderating uh, force, a way to kind of <clears throat> bring different voices together. But I think he also, <clears throat> and he said this, he supported things like same-sex education. And deep down inside, I think he also supported same race education. And I think it's Powell and Thomas that end up sparring over diversity, where Powell says, we want diversity in classrooms. That's a legitimate pedagogical goal. And Powell says, you know what, that's actually just a ruse. You're just going to use African-American students so you can improve the education of your white students. But the African-American students are actually going to be subjected to hostility, microaggressions. Better for them to go to historically black colleges. I think Powell would have said, OK, that's fine. You can also have historically black colleges. You can just have a disaggregated educational landscape. You can have Baptist schools, Methodist schools, secular schools, Catholic schools, women's schools. And he saw the more that you allow the private sector to diversify, the, more you're gonna, the harder you're going to make it for capture. So let's say liberals then captured the government. If you create a private space, Powell then believe, well, that's going to preserve liberty much more than some kind of a uh, political reform agenda. So it's a, it's a, it's a structural argument that, that might go to your point. I hadn't thought about that. But I think he does see this as this is kind of a firewall to what's happening happened in Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh, yes. Sarah. So um, one of our former students, Reggie Witt, wrote a PhD or SJD or some kind of thesis at the Catholic University in Rome about um, the African American Catholic um, d development of separate Catholic um, religious practices and music and so forth in the South. He's an African American um, Benedictine monk, right? And they sent him over to Rome to study. And his argument was that. Um, in addition to having regional dioceses and bishops, there ought to be an African-American bishop that would take all of these churches rather than having them be homogenized. If they had their own very valuable, distinctive religious practices, traditions, music, and so forth. How does that fit into your thesis? I mean, does that, is, is, is that a sort of similar idea that there is this diversity even within something as top-down as the Catholic Church? So. Uh, that's interesting. In Regents versus Bakke, Powell said, there's no such thing as a white majority. Whites are just a conglomeration of minorities. 
which is a, an odd claim. But he then distinguished himself in Anglo-Saxon Protestants from Celtic Irishmen. <laughs> and Protestants in the South had long viewed the Catholic Church as a centralized authoritarian institution, and they had fought long and hard to stop that church from spreading its message in America. And this yielded prohibition. It yielded the second Ku Klux Klan, which reemerges as a nativist, Protestant evangelical group that starts to burn the cross in 1915. During Reconstruction, it's really former Confederate officers and enlisted raging an insurgent war. But I think the Catholic Church was viewed by people like Powell as that's exactly what we don't want. However, we will allow Catholic schools to operate in the United States. And I think Powell would have said, sure, let's diversify the church. Uh, but there is a, a history of this Protestant uh, anti-Catholicism that really viewed it as a form of central, centralized authoritarian rule. <coughs> yes. So, Anders, I wonder if you could, you, you have kind of alluded to the new project you're working on, and I wonder if you maybe could talk a little bit about how it comes out of this and the kind of arguments that you're making there, because I, I think that takes, takes the argument that you're, you're working on, that you're laying out in this particular book, to a whole different level that makes us think about culture in African American life uh, in the South in a very, very different way. Just say a little bit about that? Or? Sure. So uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about racial nationalism, re-emerging United States. And uh, the new project is going to go back to the 1920s. And it's a rethinking of the so-called progressive era and the so-called jazz age. Uh, the 1920s, from a regulatory standpoint, was remarkable. We had legal prohibition. We had eugenics. We had very strict immigration standards. All of these were tied into a larger vision of an Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation. Woodrow Wilson uh, identified Anglo-Saxon Protestantism, including the common law, as heritage of England and the ancient Germanic tribes that traveled to England and conquered it. The common law went along with Anglo-Saxon Protestant ethics, a work ethic, that created capitalism. Max Weber, in 1905, gives captains of industry and conservative judges really a license to kind of promote business in the name of Anglo-Saxon Protestant civilization. So race and capitalism and law and reform, things like prohibition progressives, were on board with racial thinking in the 1920s, uh, was a very different America than the jazz age that we remember. African Americans who were dismissed, out of hand, segregated, are the first who really start to cobble together a vision of America that is aspirational and not linked to race. It begins early on with people like Frederick Douglass, but then it really starts with the patriots who went and fought in World War I. African Americans who fought for their country, even though they can't vote, they're discriminated against and segregated, start to talk about America in aspirational terms that we would recognize today that's very familiar. Yes, America is an aspirational nation that is founded on principles or ideals that have nothing to do with race. In the 1920s, this would have been anathema. Everyone believed in race, and not only did they believe in race, they were actually quite excited and positive about it. Racial thinking was scientifically endorsed. Racial thinking was progressive. In the Scopes trial in Tennessee, uh, yeah, evolutionary biology is touted as advanced thinking and much better than creationism, which was for backwoods hillbillies. But the book, Civic Biology, that was uh, being taught was actually all about race. It was about the five races of humankind, and the white race was superior, and the other races were inferior, and white people had a duty this, to, to kind of advance civilization. All this comes to a, a, a halt, I argue, in 1929. So most historians argue it's World War II that changes our thinking about race. I argue it was actually the stock market crash. With the stock market crash of 1929, Anglo-Saxon Protestants are left holding the bag. If their work ethic guaranteed capitalism, what happened? How could capitalism go into a free fall if Anglo-Saxon Protestants were at the helm? And Protestants didn't have an answer for this. And FDR, when he rides in office in 33, doesn't talk about his Anglo-Saxon Protestant heritage. He goes back to the Mayflower. He's like, no, we're going to talk about immigrants. 
and the poor, and he starts to try to come up with a new narrative, that narrative will be civil rights. It'll be Harry Truman, who is cribbing from African Americans who have really already put together a vision of the United States that is completely new. Today, the irony is the, the Americans who are most convinced and committed to the idea that we are not a racist nation are conservatives. Conservatives will fight tooth and nail to say we're not a white settler nation founded on principles of white supremacy. Madison and Jefferson were aspirational figures. Well, that's kind of the, the, the discourse that started to emerge in African-American circles, including people like Frederick Douglass, who argued the Constitution doesn't sanction slavery. And at the time, it was viewed as odd. You, why? Of course it sanctions slavery. Slavery is a categorical good in 19, or 1840. But African-Americans really started to hone the idea that American America is a nation founded on aspirational, egalitarian ideals. And everyone then starts to go back to Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. And yes, he does say all men are created equal, but I think you know anyone who knows anything about Jefferson knows who that means. And that was a type of usable past then it then became very important to the, in the early civil rights era, which starts during World War I, or it starts during slavery, frankly, but it starts to pick up steam during the 20s and the 30s. The 30s, we often view as a, a low point in American history. I view it as a high point. It's a moment where we reassess, what are we doing exactly? Are we becoming a white nationalist settler nation founded on Anglo-Saxon Protestant ideals, or are we something else? And we reassess as capitalism, and because capitalism fails, we come up with a new vision that's much more progressive. And so is the reaction, you know, in the aftermath of the New Deal and the Fair Deal and the kind of civil rights agenda of the 50s and 60s. So we've been in a, in a period that have you know, for the last 30, 40 years or so that's tried to reassert in its own particular way that earlier Anglo-Saxon vision. I mean, it's privatization and, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, the kind of, uh, you know, the policies, the particular policies of the last 20 or 30 years. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, there's been a lot of history on this, on the legacies of Jim Crow, redlining, uh, the, the suburbanization of Southern politics, the move of Democrats and the Republican, Republican Party, dog whistle politics, and all of that uh, I don't disagree with. But it's a, what I'm doing is we're really working on intellectual history. So the United States in 1925 was explicitly about race. And, and Woodrow Wilson is... is um, you know, very public about it. He watches Birth of a Nation and says, well, my God, this is, you know, truth written in lightning. And we were headed down the same road that Germany was. And what's interesting is Germany in the 30s veers towards racial nationalism. We veer in the opposite direction. Why? Because capitalism fails, and Protestants had always been arguing that they could handle it. The Nazis ride into power using the rhetoric of socialism. And Anglo-Saxon Protestants had never relied on that. So Nazism works in a weird way because they double down on this class argument. Yes, we always we never we wanted a classless society. That's what Hitler promised, a classless society for Germans. But Protestants in the United States said, we don't want a classless society. We're Protestant, we're elect, and our blessing is, is clearly demonstrable in our financial success. And that thinking just comes to a crashing halt. And so the ideology fails. And then we oddly come up with a much more inclusive vision of the United States. And certainly by the time the Nazis really get rolling in World War II, then I think terms like Anglo-Saxon quickly disappear. And so that is true. I mean, historians are absolutely right. By the time that we learn what's going on in Central Europe in the bloodlands, then we start to distance ourselves as fast as we can. And that doesn't mean that people don't continue to adhere to racist views. But the way this is Gradelian, the way ideas work is they have an afterlife. And so if you tell your children something, uh, let's say race is good, it doesn't necessarily matter what the federal government is saying. I mean, Harry Truman can be talking about racial equality, but if your oral history is, no, we're Anglo-Saxon Protestants and we built civilization, things that we're still seeing echoes of today. This is Richard Spencer, the guy washed out of Duke, <laughs> who wants to create a European homeland uh, peacefully. 
And he knows the reason he probably washed out of Duke was we had that. It was Europe in the 20th century that create, committed suicide twice, and it was the United States that saved it. And that thinking is something we have to uh, address. We have to address racialist thinking. It's a theory. And if you don't read Tom Segru or Kevin Cruz or, or Joe Crispino, you might think, oh, well, race explains everything, you know? Uh, race is pretty much the answer. It's like a simplistic theory. And that's always going to reemerge, uh, and it's something that I think education, every new generation of undergrads that come into SLU, we've got to re-educate them on this is the history of the country, this is what happened. They'll be like, well, wait a minute, you know, there's all this crime, and, you know, race seems to explain it. And so that's kind of the odd thing about racism is it's a very... Uh, easy theory for people to grasp. It's a very simplistic theory, and like gender and other things like that, it's something that then keeps reconfiguring itself. About um, Thomas Wolfe, the 1930s, going to uh, get all these accolades for his awards, uh, awards in Germany, because he's a best-selling author in Germany. And then he gets there, and he discovers what's really going on. Or he says he discovers what's really going on and writes, uh, I have a thing to tell you, which is more or less, I think, his, his attempt to try and uh, distance himself <laughs> from his popularity in what appears to be, to him, a frightening totalitarian nation. I just wondered if you had looked at that at all. I know he's not as um, well regarded as most of the other authors that you're talking about, pretty much autobiographical and local, but um, it's an interesting read. He in that in that book, he's 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 being feted and or in that section, he's being feted and and uh, celebrated for a work that he's written about, say, growing up in North Carolina, uh, and yet at the same time, he's seeing what a repressive regime it is, and he's horrified. And for he's initially excited to be um, glorified going overseas, and then he sees what's going on, and on a particular train ride, when he observes a, a person being um, basically pulled off the train um, and detained and arrested. Um, and subsequently taken away for the crime of exporting currency uh, from, uh, from Germany. Uh, he begins to see the anti-Semitism in all this. He begins to, I think, think about the impact of his writing. And arguably, his writing certainly has, is very much from a white, white supremacy perspective, very much the Anglo-Saxon Protestant perspective. Are there other Southern writers, I guess is what I'm asking you, that, that have had this realization that their, uh, their fans are, are are, are something that's a little bit detestable and they may have had a change of heart? Or do you think that's something that an artist typically goes through? Uh, so the most, one of the most interesting finds on Powell, and this is a thread in a lot of these writers, is in 1972, Powell uh, addressed a meeting of the ABA in San Francisco. It's a prayer breakfast. And Powell stands up and he says, I want to talk about the beautiful society. And everyone thinks the beautiful society, you're going to talk about you know, the new left or the SDS. And he says, it's Fiddler on the Roof. And he talks about Tevier, who's living in Central Europe, and he's trying to maintain his traditions, and he's trying to keep his daughters from marrying outside the faith. And he says, this is what we in the South have been trying to do. We're not Nazis, and this is pretty recurring. The Southern elites didn't affiliate themselves, for the most part, with Nazis. They said, no, we're more like the ancient Hebrews. And we are trying to preserve our ancient traditions and our ancient cultures against this totalitarian federal government who is steamrolling us. And oddly, Zora Neale Hurston, her last work was on Herod the Great. And Hurston has been written off as someone who lost her mind. When people read the Orlando Sentinel letter, they said, oh, Hurston's lost her mind. You know, why isn't she on board with civil rights? Answer, because she's a pluralist. And so in Herod the Great, she tells the stories of the ancient Jews and how King Herod preserved Judaic culture and traditions. And Hurston's uh, argument is pretty clear, that minorities can often be the bearers of a special truth, and that their traditions and their culture can be very important and very uh, necessary to preserve. And that's what she's doing. In her work, she's preserving African-American culture. Powell's preserving white culture. And Robert Penn Warren's got this great line uh, where he says, you know, Jews and Southerners, we're all the same. We've all been misunderstood and discriminated against. And there's this recurring kind of trope, which is Southerners view themselves as a minority or put upon who are trying to preserve their traditions, not totalitarians. And they really see the federal government as much more akin to what's happening in Germany uh, 
than what they're doing. That's it. All right, I think we can stop there. Yeah, should we, any other questions? Uh, then, then we'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew.